You are the Arisen, an ordinary human, except for the fact that your heart was pilfered by a dragon. We pick up in the midst of an assault on the Dragon's Keep, the Tainted Mountain, assisted by the Duke's soldiers from the nearby capital, and Pawns, which are beings from beyond the Rift, whose sole purpose is to aid the Arisen in their efforts to slay the dragon. The Arisen fights through droves of monsters, eventually crossing paths with a massive chimera. Part lion, part snake, part goat, all dangerous. Once the chimera is slain, the dragon calls out. Now choose, flee, or step forth. Take hold of what lies beyond. Claim mastery over the eternal ring. Everyone knows the legend. The dragon is destined to spawn forth from the rift to pocket the heart of a mortal, and that mortal becomes the arisen, destined to hunt and slay the dragon. You are a contributing citizen of a tiny village, Cassardus, situated right next to the sea. Today, like every day, is quiet. Waves gently touch at the shore, the sun is warm, and the endless waters provide enough fish to afford a simple and pleasant life. The Duke's soldiers are at the main gate, enlisting aid in response to the growing whispers that the dragon has returned, but this isn't truly a concern for you. It's, it's the dragon! Until the dragon shows up. The abrupt chorus of crumbling homes and the screams of women and children spurs you to take action. The Duke's men, in all their bravery, fled the scene almost immediately, so you reach for one of their dropped swords and head to face the dragon. Not to kill it, that would be insane, but just to divert its attention away from charboiling your friends and neighbors. You're a hair larger than one of the dragon's toes, and, rightfully so, it doesn't even acknowledge your presence. Try as you might, your blade simply glances at the impenetrable cascade of scales lining every inch of the dragon, and you get swatted away like a bug. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your general outlook, when the dragon smacked you, your sword became lodged in its hand. You now have the dragon's attention. It speaks in a language you can't understand before plunging one of its talons into your chest and extracts your still beating heart before leaving the scene. Your childhood friend Kina finds you, somehow still breathing, and has you carted off to a makeshift infirmary. Once you regain consciousness, you peer down at the massive scar now on your chest, and you hear the dragon's booming voice as if it was right there in the room with you. You grab some gear from the side table in the room and go to leave, only to hear Kina speaking with the village elder, Adaro, in the hall. Kina is relaying your condition as it appears, an individual with no heartbeat, alive and breathing. Adaro thinks it's the work of magic, which isn't exactly wrong, but as long as you're still technically alive, you have one mission, slay the dragon and take back your heart. You pass by a rift stone, a large monument with ancient writings etched into it as you reach the village gate. A rift opens, and you're met by the arrival of Rook, a pawn. Adara witnesses this and tells you what he knows of pawns. They come from some unknown place, just appear without a warning. They're a strange lot. He says they're not human. They look like humans, but they lack the spark, the will that drives a human. They have no capacity to feel or act on their own. Adara suggests you and Rook make your way for the encampment west of the village where men are gathering to face the dragon, since there will likely be more pawns there. After trudging along the road for a bit, you arrive at the encampment, but you hear a strange voice calling out to you. Not just from far away, but from beyond this realm. The voice is coming from the Riftstone here in the encampment. Can you hear our voice? He explains that he's speaking to us from beyond the rift, and explains that the Arisen is the only one who possesses the will to guide the Pawn Legion. 
the collective name encompassing all pawns across the rift, but the Arisen must prove he has what it takes. You walk away from the rift stone only to hear a commotion about a beast approaching the encampment. The beast comes! Hurry! A cyclops accompanied by a pack of goblins. A threat, sure, but it's no dragon. Once you've dealt with them all, a robed figure who was watching the event skulks away into the shadows. Apparently, that was enough proof for the voice beyond the rift because you are then assigned a main pawn who will be with you from now until your journey is complete. Not only that, all nearby pawns converge to pledge their support. Our fealty is sworn to you, Arisen. From this day, the legions men call pawns live and die by your command. Sir Mercedes, a knight in service to the Duke, urges you to make use of the encampment while you still can, so you opt to get some rest. A short time later, you're woken up by some commotion. You head out of your tent and look up to be greeted by the head of an enormous snake, which immediately lunges at you. Then another head appears, and then two more, and you are now aware of what you have to face, a hydra. It lays waste to a good chunk of the encampment before you manage to sever one of the heads. You notice the severed head has a glowing blood red symbol of some kind, but it fades before anyone else can see. The soldiers marvel at your handiwork. I am impressed. Oh, I'll be damned! This your handiwork? For truth? And Sir Mercedes suggests making a gift of the head as tribute to the Duke of Granzis, Edmund Dragonsbane, incurring favor with someone as powerful as the Duke himself could be beneficial to say the least. Sir Mercedes and her men strap the Hydra head to a cart, and you, along with a contingent of soldiers, escort the cart through the monster-filled canyon that separates southern and northern Granzis. After what seems like an eternity, you arrive at the capital city, Grand Soren. Sir Mercedes says she'll head up to the Duke's castle to report on all that's happened. I'll have words sent for you, friend. Pray sojourn in the capital a while. the castle main step lively as she leaves you're approached by a goofy looking man dressed in a simple tunic ah fortune smiles upon me well met sir it is and i am called mason if it please you he looks simple sure but you get a weird feeling he knows a whole lot more about a whole lot more than you do my word to you begin with the pawns any lead is a good lead right now so you decide to heed his suggestion and head down to the pawn guild there, you meet Barnaby, the guild's caretaker, who presents you with a task only an Arisen can handle. He guides you down to a locked gate and unlocks it before explaining further. Beyond lies the Everfall, an ancient place that sleeps beneath Grand Soren's stones. We pawns have long served as keepers of the entrance to this place. But since the dragon's coming, a strange aura has filled the Everfall. A presence. Barnaby just needs a renowned warrior such as the Arisen to go down and have a quick look around. We won't tell him that you were just a simple fisherman less than 24 hours ago. You see why the Everfall was named as such because it takes ages to reach the bottom, to say nothing of the reanimated skeletons, the undead soldiers, and the troll that tried to stop you. Once you make it to what appears to be the ground floor, you notice the floor is giving off a mysterious light and a bit of a draft only to be ambushed by the fanged tentacles of an evil eye. You don't see the main body, only an innumerable and endlessly spawning array of spell-casting tentacles, which you are not equipped to handle at the moment. So you and your pawns hot-footed all the way back to the surface. You relay your findings and near-death experience to Barnaby. He says that they really don't know too much about the Everfall, but what little they do know does not include what we just witnessed, so on the off chance it turns into something much worse down the line, he and the other pawns will be extra vigilant from this point forward. As you leave the pawn guild, one of the Duke's soldiers is waiting to inform you that the Duke has received the tribute, the Hydra Head, and deems you worthy of joining the Worm Hunt. The Worm Hunt is the Duke's order of knights who are preparing to face the dragon head on, and they are led by... Sir Maximilian Eisenstern. Captain of the Hunt, so named by His Grace Duke Edmund Dragonsbane. He explains that you must take on orders given by the Duke himself so that you may further assist the efforts of the Worm Hunt. 
decipher the writings on an ancient stone slate in order to possibly learn vital information that could be used against the dragon, retake the southwest hold that was overrun by a monster infestation, investigate a cult calling themselves Salvation, and aid a research team in their efforts to explore some ruins. The most relevant tasks here are the slate and the cult. Your task to decipher the ancient slate brings you into contact with the Dragon Force, another arisen from long ago, whose mission to slay the dragon was unfulfilled. You see me, yes? Then congratulations are due. You have found the man you seek. I am, or was, perhaps like you. He and his pawn, referred to as the Fool, have been around for centuries, guiding any arisen that came after him. The Dragonforge is also the only person we find who can read dragon speak, and he tells us the slate is actually a cipher, written and designed in such a way that it will undoubtedly fall into the hands of the arisen and eventually lead the arisen to meet the Dragonforge so that he may pass on what he knows about the dragon. He could just send a letter addressed to the arisen and avoid all that trouble, but I digress. Your task to learn more about the cult called Salvation leads you to one of their meeting places, some catacombs west of the capital. You fight your way down through the darkness and scores of undead until you reach their meeting place, where you find the same robed figure that was near the encampment when the troll attacked and when the Hydra struck. Come to join our flock, Arisen. The robed man, Elysian, leads the cult of salvation, and his message is simple. The dragon has been sent to save humanity by ushering in an age of darkness and chaos that will swallow the land. Makes perfect sense. Before you can react, Elysian unleashes a horde of undead that consume the cult members who were in attendance and then set their sights on you. Once you dispatch them, you hear a familiar voice from beyond the chamber door. Quite a sight that was. Though I suppose it's the stuff of every day to you, Elysian. It's Mason, and he cornered one of the escaping cult members. He posits that the cult member may be able to provide some useful information, but since he's seen your faces, and seen you together, it may be dangerous to let him leave. You can choose to spare him or whack him, and in my case, I whacked him. Mason is impressed, now knowing that you'll do whatever it takes to root out the evils that plague Grantis. I'll send word along, friend. We'll bring this skulk of foxes to bear, you and I. After your tasks are completed, you report to Sir Maximilian, and he informs you the Duke has granted you an audience, but no pawns are permitted within the castle walls, so the rest of your party has to wait outside. Once you enter the Duke's castle, you are ushered into the throne room by the Duke's court jester, but not before he slips a ridiculous hat onto your head. Everyone in attendance has a good laugh at your expense, the Duke included. <laughs> I fear your crown outshines my own. <laughs> We're here on business, however, so the Duke officially knights you, making you an official member of the Worm Hunt, and directing you to receive royal orders from his right-hand man. How fared your audience with his grace, Arisen? Aldous Ludric Sorn at your service, sir. I serve as a chamberlain in the Duke's court. There are four assignments Aldous has for you, but none of them are directly relevant to the dragon. Aid a hunting expedition in slaying a griffin that's been terrorizing the plains outside the capital, gather evidence to aid in the trial of Fornival Frescobaldi, recover the Duke's ring which was stolen by a fugitive sorcerer named Salamet, and help Sir Mercedes in uncovering what dark machinations are happening at the Northern Hold. Irrelevant as they are, there were some fun moments, like when you defeat Salamet and his big bad guy demeanor drops off in hilarious fashion. Talisman! Or, when Mercedes loses the duel to Lord Julian, and he doesn't kill her, but he certainly does not let her off easy. Do it! Your head is a meager trophy. The men of the fort may have use of you yet. 
Even a she-god's skin can warm a desperate man of nights. What? There's no slender beneath you! Once your assignments are handled, report back to Aldous and you two will be interrupted by a soldier bringing word from the Mountain Way Castle in the south. What? Very well. I shall see to it at once. Apparently, another soldier made it to the Way Castle after an assignment afar, but was gravely wounded and would only keep saying he needs to relay a message to the Arisen. Aldous remarks that it's weird he didn't relay the important message to the courier, but he chalks it up to the wounded soldier not thinking clearly. You head south to the Way Castle and things are oddly calm, with no sign of trouble or concern. Arisen, urgent word from the capital, sir. You are to return to Aldous' side with all possible haste. Turns out, a dead cockatrice, some monstrous quadrupedal rooster, was brought in as tribute to the Duke, likely by some members of Salvation. Once it was within the city gates, it was revived, probably with the goal of wreaking havoc across the capital. You get back to the city just in time to challenge the creature and drive it off before too many people are hit by its petrifying breath. Once the crisis is averted, you report back to Aldous, who is, rightfully, annoyed with and disappointed in himself. What damage have I wrought in carelessness to allow an agent of salvation through? And in sending you away before the creature was revived, the damage was all the greater. While I, in my fool credulity, ran to the castle, only to be knocked incensed by some villain. Aldous tells you that the Duke, ever impressed by your heroism, has an expedition planned and he wants you to lead it. Quite the honor, to be sure. You head up to meet with the Duke, and the Duke sees to it you are amply rewarded for everything you've done up to this point. There's no call for humility, sir. Take it. As you're stuffing your pockets full with the contents of the treasury, a soldier rushes in with urgent news from the Great Wall, the castle far to the northwest of Grand Soren. It's been overrun by the forces of salvation, and many soldiers have been killed or imprisoned. Duke Edmund says the expedition can wait, and asks that you recapture the Great Wall immediately. After an arduous journey wrought with bandits and monsters, you finally make it to the Great Wall. The second you set foot within the gates, you're met with two armed cyclopses and a batch of snow harpies. Once they're all dealt with, there are contingents of undead and salvation members littering the corridors of the inner castle. You manage to save any soldiers you find and slay any enemies you see as you make your way to the top. You reach the upper floor just as a chimera is trying to make a meal out of a soldier. Mad! Salvation is mad to conjure up such monsters! The soldier witnesses you make short work of the beast and then unlocks the door to let you proceed. Once you reach the top of the Great Wall, Elysian is waiting for you. Ah, the Arisen. Welcome. <laughs> He draws a dagger, imbues it with dark magic, and kills the two cult members that are with him, transforming them into whites, flying spellcasters that can be exceedingly annoying. Once you blight the whites, Elysian draws your attention upward, where the sky is whipping into a dark, cloudy vortex, out of which the dragon rushes down to shut Elysian up for good. This is absolute truth! of an upjump zealot make for tedious listening. His ilk serves no role in what is to come. Only my death will staunch the flood of destruction, a task still far beyond your need. If you would face me, seek me out, and I shall know it. Zealot's lesson well, when the weak or death may find it. The dragon says, until you're ready to face him, he will keep your heart, and the dragon forged can speak to his diligence in that regard. Once the dragon takes his leave, you do the same, and make the trek back to the dwelling of the dragon force. The hour is come, Arisen. The door lies open. 
Seek the temple atop the tainted mountain, beyond the Great Wall. At its pinnacle, in the shadow of the worm, keeper of the Endless Ring, you will make your choice. What you there become, only you can decide. It is now time for the final battle. You make your preparations and set out to the mountain beyond the Great Wall, completely unsure of what may happen, but knowing in your uh, chest cavity that it's what you have to do. You are the Arisen, an ordinary human, except for the fact that your heart was pilfered by a dragon. You and your pawns commence the assault, cutting a swath through whatever monsters may try to stop you on your journey to retake what is yours. Just like an Arisen before you, your assault on the castle culminates in a battle with a Chimera outside the main hold. Once slain, you and your pawns open the door to the Tainted Mountain to fulfill your purpose. What is your purpose here, Arisen? If you sought to live, you had naught but run and hide yourself away. But then, tell me, child of man, what does it mean to live in truth? <clears throat> to wage war against the passing of days? To pray to the unseen for a few breaths more? To raise grand cities from stone, and spawn new life in turn. Mankind has done this, yes, and more. But is the tapestry you need truly of your own design? The dragon offers you a choice. Slay him, regain your heart, and thwart the coming darkness, or sacrifice the one which you hold most dear in exchange for becoming pretty much immortal. You won't get your heart back, but you'll be celebrated as the slayer of the dragon, you'll have anyone and anything you desire, and possibly take the title and throne of Duke from the current ruler, and the dragon will leave these lands. The dragon confirms what we've already suspected. The man who rules Grandis now, Duke Edmund Dragonsbane, gained his position long ago through the same bargain. You are no false hero, and you didn't embark on a grand quest fraught with danger and peril just to return to a quiet life in a fishing hamlet. Your choice is to fight. Your choice is made. The battle takes you through the narrow corridors of the Tainted Mountain, trying your best to strike where you can, but the dragon is no less hardy than he was the day you first encountered him. Your battle rages on, leading across a long and narrow bridge that the dragon bays in flames as you try to cross. Once you reach a tower at the far end of the bridge, you spot a ballista placement which should do wonders to knock the dragon free of its rule over the skies. One of your shots makes a perfectly clean entry into the dragon's chest, wherein lies its heart, and sends him reeling. Undoubtedly now very annoyed, the dragon blows through the tower with hopes to bury you deep under its rubble but realizes you've grabbed a hold of the spikes on its back. It tries to shake you free, but you make your way up its spine until you get right above a glowing spot on its back and strike. You're thrown free of the dragon, free falling, and the dragon opens wide as it flies upwards towards you, intending to swallow you whole. You narrowly avoid its gaping maw, and in doing so your heartless chest pulses in recognition of your own heart within the dragon, and the two resonate causing the dragon to become stunned and fall all the way down to solid ground. The hour for turning back is past. The world will have its answer. You or me. Death or life beyond. You and your loyal pawns clash with the dragon narrowly avoiding hellish flames and world-ending slams. You have a few close calls, but your measured strikes at the dragon's open chest wound send it reeling from time to time, 
affording you brief chances to regroup and refocus. After a while, it's unclear even to you which of you will still be standing at the end. No task in your journey has been this daunting, but where the resolution of your past battles was simply expedited by the presence of the Arisen, this challenge is one only you can meet. After the most tiring ordeal you've undertaken thus far, the dragon comes down. You are equal parts relieved and exhausted. However, instead of the sky turning bright and giving way to a raucous cheer of victory from you and your party, the sky grows even darker than it already was. Uh, stubborn child. Whatever meaning life holds, it makes men deaf to all reason. Heed me well, Arisen. In my death, you've won a future for this world. But what that future spells for you, for all men, is a truth you'll find staring back from this world's utmost depth. Back in Grand Soren, part of the city falls out from underneath. Houses collapse and streets disappear, making the Everfall known to everyone who didn't know it was under the city this entire time. Arisen, you have earned back what is yours. In defeating the dragon, you've regained your heart, but others have lost as well. The Dragonforged, who only lived due to the dragon still living, weathered away into dust right before the fool's eyes. And Duke Edmund, whose youthful appearance for a man of his age was miraculous, was replaced by the visage of a feeble and decrepit man with stark gray hair and one foot in the grave. Once the dragon too collapses into a pile of dust, you journey down the tainted mountain and reunite with the one you hold most dear. The credits roll, and this could be considered the end, but not the true end. You awaken back in Cassidus, with your love by your side and your pawn still in your service. The skies are unnaturally dark, and it's obvious there's something amiss. Unsure of what else to do, you make your way back to Grand Soren to report the slaying of the dragon to Duke Edmund. You arrive at the Duke's castle and make your way up to the Duke's office, but you can immediately sense something isn't right. You... you met with the dragon? And don't think for a minute. I don't know what you did then. I, I of all men. Duke Edmund knows you met with the dragon, but doesn't know what the outcome was. All he knows is he is a shadow of his former self and he is not happy about it. At the time when he was arisen, Duke Edmund sacrificed that which was most dear to him, his wife, and took the dragon's bargain claiming he felled the great beast and reaping all the rewards that would result in doing so. He has no idea what would happen if the dragon was actually slain, but judging by his raggedy appearance and the state of the city and the skies right now, and how you are still alive and well, he assumes you also struck a bargain with the dragon. One where you usurp the throne and take over as the new ruler of Granzis. Incensed beyond reason, Edmund grabs his sword and lunges at you with all the fury his frail little body can muster. You do your best not to kill him, but you have to smack him a few times to get him to back off. One of your strikes sends Edmund careening through his window and onto the balcony, which alerts nearby soldiers to the incident, and they come to see what's what. The soldiers haven't seen the Duke since he gained his new, unsightly appearance, so all it looks like is the Arisen threw the Duke out of his office window. Duke Edmund sees this opportunity, yelling that the Arisen struck a bargain with the dragon to take over as the ruler of the lands and bring darkness down upon them all. He has become its minion, spreading evil upon this land as upon its ruler. Just look upon the hellish wall that gapes where once our city stood. And tell me, this is not the work of the dragon's dark magic? It's your word against the Duke's and he signs the guards' paychecks, so they turn on you immediately. 
You make your escape from the Duke's castle only to be confronted by Sir Maximilian and a squad of soldiers. I knew you for a villain. You and your pawns could stand your ground and fight, but there's four of you and dozens of guards, so you would be overwhelmed eventually. You and your pawns flee to the city square, but you are cornered from every angle with your back to the Everfall. When a sudden earthquake heralds the coming of a torrent of flying monsters from its depths. At that moment, the dragon's last words echo in your head. It is a truth you'll find staring back from this world's utmost depth. While your head is reeling from this revelation, a stray monster knocks you off balance and you descend into the Everfall. You manage to catch a ledge and pull yourself up when you are met by another voice, not just from far away, but from beyond this realm. If you would heed my call, prove now your worth. Show that you've the strength to break the yoke that binds you. Shortly after the voice fades, Kinsei greets you. I would ask aught of you, Arisen. She was one of the pawns called to aid the Arisen from long ago in his assault on the Tainted Mountain. She asks you to take up the work of her original master and collect 20 wake stones. After felling beast, after beast, after beast, after beast, you collect 20 wake stones and get back to Kinsei. With the Wake Stones, Kinsei can help you open a rift into whatever lies beyond, below, where no one has ventured before. You land in a chamber that seems to extend for miles in all directions into nothingness. Seated in the center is a brightly glowing hooded figure the source of the voice you heard a short while earlier. Well met, Arisen. I'll not waste time on rhetoric. Defeat me, and take my place as keeper of this world. If you defeat them, you'll become the new Sensual, the new god of the world you once inhabited. The same world you've journeyed across up until now. The Sensual shows you how effortlessly you can will living beings into and out of existence. It conjures a being identical to you, and then snuffs out its existence in the same instant. Power you will possess if you are able to best them. The Sensual offers you a choice. Continue to fight for your seat as god of this world, or return to a quiet but peaceful life void of divine responsibility. You press on. Shrugging off the words of the friends you've made and the relationships you've forged. Nothing will dissuade your will to fight. You are close now. So very close to me. The Sensual reveals himself as Savan, the Arisen of Old, and now it all makes sense. He fought to the Tainted Mountain. He bested the Dragon Ven, he found his own path to what lies beyond, he challenged and bested the Sensual, the Arisen before him, and took the seat of God, ruling over the world, until such a time when another Arisen would challenge him. The final battle is a trial to end all. Savan and his main pawn against you, the Arisen, and your main pawn. Once you defeat them both, Savan explains the reason for the trials. Arisen, forgive me. All I've done is to test your will. The endless cycle continues. Remember what the dragon said to Savan all that time ago. Take hold of what lies beyond. Claim mastery over the eternal ring. The central, 
or God, is an arisen who has conquered all in their path and displayed uncontestable willpower, becoming the sole keeper of this world. It is the Sensual's duty to watch over it from the Sensual's chamber and ensure that the world continues to exist. The Sensual has the power to create life and the power to bring about destruction, but that power does not last forever since the world draws its sustenance from the will of the Sensual, gradually draining it. Eventually, all life in the world would be void of that spark, that will that drives us, and the world would wither and die. This means that another with sufficient determination and willpower would need to take over as Sensual at some point. To this end, the Sensual spawns a dragon from the rift to find the next Arisen. Those who are chosen as Arisen by the dragon display courage by confronting the beast and, more importantly, displaying the visceral will to survive. Of the few Arisen who reached the Sensual, the ones who do not have the force or strength of will needed to sustain life fall and become a dragon, destined to seek out the following Arisen, thus keeping the endless cycle, the eternal ring, in motion. It always repeats itself and none can escape the turn of the wheel of existence. It is the fate of all Arisen. You and I are swept up in the current, same as the rest. Each tempers the volition of the next, and the endless cycle continues. In order to assume your role essential, Savan presents you with the God's Bane Blade, which is the only thing that can sever the essential from his seat and pass his role on to you. This is how you take hold of what lies beyond. Once you plunge the blade into Savan's heart, he thanks you for granting him death, granting him freedom. At long last, I am free of eternity, of infinity, free of the cruel, unending ring. Only you and your pawn remain here, in the great beyond. You take your seat as Sensual and keep watch over the world as a voiceless, faceless presence. You visit Cassidus. It's as bright and sunny as you remember it, but you're unable to interact with anyone. You visit Grand Soren. The hustle and bustle of the capital is carrying on without a care in the world. The town crier announces the dragon, or a dragon knowing what you know now, has been sighted, and the Arisen, whoever the new dragon selected, stands ready with the soldiers of the capital prepared to challenge it. Will this Arisen slay the dragon, or decide to take its bargain? If they take the bargain, and the dragon remains, will the Arisen after that slay the dragon? What about the Arisen after that? And the one after that, how long must you sit and wait and watch before another Arisen ventures to beyond life and existence to challenge you? And even if they do, will they possess the undying will to defeat you and assume the role of Sensual? The eternal ring will turn and turn again. It always does. How long will it be? How long will you be confined to this chamber? Days? Weeks? Months? Years? Centuries? You can't take this. You don't want this. You have to do something. You have to. You still have the God's Bane Blade. You can do something. The very last thing you can do. You can claim mastery over the Eternal Ring. By breaking it. Once and for all. No! The Sensual is no more and the chamber opens up to release your lifeless body along with your pawn who desperately tries to save you. Master! All realities, every link in the chain, every inch of the ring converges into this single timeline. As you both plunge into the sea. Sometime later, you wash up on the shore in the village of Cassidus. You snap awake. Master! Only it's not you. It's your pawn, whose entire being now inhabits the empty vessel that you left behind after the God's Bane Blade severed your soul from all divine responsibility. What happens now? You've made your choice. You stepped forth. You took hold of what lies beyond. 
and you claimed mastery over the Eternal Ring. You have no way of knowing what will become of the world you've left behind. But you can't help but feel like it'll be just fine. 